arrived to support it. In 1912, British scientist Charles Dawson made the Piltdown Man discovery and changed the world. Piltdown Man was considered the missing link, supposedly the skull and jawbone of a half-man, half-ape mutation. It convinced millions that Darwin's theory was scientifically proved. But in 1953, some 40 years later, Piltdown was declared a hoax. It was uh, somebody taking a human skull and an ape's jawbone. They broke off uh, the joint where they would fit together so they couldn't tell, then filed them down, made them look really old, and, and uh, buried them in a gravel pit. It was a hoax, a deliberate, either a joke, which they never told anybody about for 40 years, or a lie to try to prove the evolution theory. In either case, it may be said that no other discovery in the 20th century has had as great an impact on furthering evolution than Piltdown. Stephen Jay Gould writes that Piltdown absorbed the professional attention of many fine scientists. It led millions of people astray for 40 years. Researcher Richard Harder reports that more than 500 articles and memoirs were written on the Piltdown finds before the hoax was exposed. Likewise, articles in encyclopedias and sections in textbooks and popular books of science, an immense amount of derivative work. For many years, the Piltdown finds were a significant percentage of the fossils which were used to reconstruct human ancestry. In his book, The Piltdown Forgery, J.S. Weiner remarks that this ill-begotten form of primitive man received nearly as much attention as all the legitimate specimens in the fossil record put together. Yet once the hoax was exposed, the scientific community failed to repent of its error. The damage had already been done, and a generation of evolutionary thought had been born. Dawson himself never lived to be exposed. He died shortly after his famous discovery in 1916. While controversy over the hoax continues, today the BBC refers to Dawson as the Piltdown Faker. They write that of his discoveries, at least 38 are fakes. The only suspect in these frauds is Charles Dawson himself, the same man who uncovered the remains of Eanthropus Dawsoni, the Piltdown Man. BBC concludes that for Charles Dawson, Piltdown was not a one-off hoax, more the culmination of a life's work. Yet Dawson did not act alone. His partner in the Piltdown affair was a young paleontologist and Roman Catholic Jesuit priest named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. I tend to believe in a Catholic priest named Pierre de Chardin was involved in this also, and he really pushed evolution on the Catholic Church. Uh, because he said, oh, we got proof, we got this half man, half monkey. After Dawson's death, Teilhard would become heir to the find of the century and may be the man most responsible for the normalization of evolutionary thinking in Western culture today. Teilhard would go on to work in China and take part in the now famous Peking Man discovery, a collection of would-be missing links that mysteriously disappeared in 1941 before anyone could fully examine them. Of 175 fossil fragments recorded, all were supposedly lost. Only the notes and photographs taken by Teilhard and his team of scientists remain. Modern critics question the integrity of the find because of Teilhard's association with Charles Dawson, the Piltdown faker. But Teilhard's scientific deceptions are minor when compared to the theological abyss that he sought to drag himself and humanity into. He wrote, Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is the general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow, and which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines must follow. Treated as an apostate by the Vatican, banned from teaching, and forbidden to publish his writings, Teilhard became the hero of sophisticated Protestants and then returned to the good graces of Rome 26 years after his death. The Catholic Church, that once rejected evolutionary thinking, seems to have been among those who bowed to its hypothesis, 
largely due to the influence of Teilhard, who had become a hero and role model for a whole generation of younger priests and theologians. He set the stage for the renewal movements which finally came to flower in the era of Vatican II. Vatican II is the Catholic document that launched the ecumenical movement for the purpose of ultimately unifying mankind in a universal faith. Evolution plays a key role in ecumenism since the pagan religions of the world are largely based on its precepts. Under Pope John Paul II, Rome now considers evolution to be a part of the gospel truth. It is reported that the Pope has put the teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church firmly behind the view that the human body is the product of a gradual process of evolution. But the influence of this Jesuit priest would reach far beyond the walls of Rome. In 1985, author Marilyn Ferguson published her controversial book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, which USA Today called the Handbook of the New Age. In it, Ferguson describes a worldwide conspiracy of people seeking to bring about a paradigm shift in global consciousness. In the Los Angeles Times, Marilyn Ferguson revealed that Teilhard was the name most frequently mentioned by 185 leaders in the New Age movement when Ferguson asked who was the most influential person in their lives. By the end of the 20th century, Teilhard du Chardin would be known by many as the father of the New Age. Teilhard died in 1955, but his passing only marked the beginning of his meteoric rise to fame. His treatises, long suppressed, were published and quickly translated into all major languages. Harvard's Widener Library now houses an entire tier of books devoted to Teilhard's writing and thinking. Today, more and more people, Christians as well as non-Christians, accept his views and take keen interest in studying his philosophy. He has become known for his theory that man is evolving mentally and socially toward a final spiritual unity. Andrew Jackson Davis, known by some as the prophet of the new revelation, channeled a message from the spirit realm that called for the paleontological sciences to direct man's perception of God through the study of nature. Is it merely coincidence that Teilhard du Chardin, a priest and paleontologist, would lead the way into the dawn of a new age? Researcher Charles P. Henderson writes, this paleontologist and Jesuit priest made it his personal mission to reconstruct the most basic Christian doctrines from the perspectives of science. He would do this by overthrowing all the barriers that had been erected between science and religion. He would take the lessons learned from the study of nature as the foundation on which to reconstruct the Christian faith. After the similar examples of Swedenborg, Phineas Quimby, and Mary Baker Eddy, Teilhard sought to deny the reality of sin and openly rejected the biblical gospel. In 1947, Teilhard said, very definitely there was no Adam and no Eve and no original sin. He wrote that original sin continually obstructs the natural expansion of our religion. It is a straitjacket that checks any movement of heart or head. It binds us hand and foot and drains the blood from us because it represents a survival of static concepts that are an anachronism in our evolutionist system of thought. A Catholic newsletter says that in the theology of Teilhard, we are all becoming Christ. There is no original sin and therefore no need of redemption. Evolutionary forces are ferrying everyone along to Godhood and all are anonymous Christians making faith in the literal death and resurrection of Christ unnecessary. The American Atheist magazine understands the situation too well. It writes, destroy Adam and Eve and original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God and take away the meaning of his death. But did Teilhard intend to undermine the Christ of the Bible? Some have thought so since Teilhard's evolutionary teachings parallel Eastern mysticism and pagan theology. The whole Eastern pagan theological worldview is to undermine the deity of Christ. 
and to elevate the deity of humanity. So Eastern mysticism, paganism, is talking about the God within. The way they Christianize it is by saying Christ is within me. I am the Christ or the Antichrist that's going to come is the Christ or the Lord, the Maitreya. So all of it is actually